trouble too, as he freely aired his anti-church views. That would lead to lively showdowns, after which he would rev up his motorbike and hightail it off some time to pay to immerse himself in the treasury of tunes and songs he found there. The family were then all caught up with his new passion for folk music. My mother in particular was overjoyed, rediscovering her pride in the music of her childhood, though she also adored the contemporary music that was part of the Johnston's repertoire. We all had a mental image of herself and my aunt Rita sitting by the record player with a few bottles of Guinness, playing Johnston's LPs over and over again, <laughs> and tearing strips out of any other group Threatened, <laughs> threatened their sleep in the After moving to the States in 1973 to study at the University of Pennsylvania, he made sure to include the family in his life, often bringing friends to Limerick, like his mentor, Professor Ken Goldstein, and his wife, Rochelle, and Cass and Pat, the lot of you here today. Nick was a great man for sending people to stay in the family home when he wasn't there himself. <laughs> my, my parents, ever hospitable, became good friends with many of the visitors. Nick and his dear wife, Phil, in Fenton, visited often, and we, in turn, experienced their home in Harvey Street, Philadelphia, and the wonderful generosity of Nick, Phil, and later Judy. We were introduced to the beautiful music that he made with Eugene O'Donnell and the budding young Jeeves, Shane Seagan. We heard about the music of Ed Reilly, about the virtuoso playing of Liz Carroll, Jimmy Keane, Joan Madden, the Green Fields of America, and so many more. During this late 80s period, we suffered the cruel loss of our brothers, Brendan and Kieran. Their deaths were devastating for us all. I like to think that his involvement with music brought Nick some comfort during those years. We were also beginning to be aware of his struggle with addiction then, which was not a new experience for us as a family, as our father had overcome alcoholism in his early 40s. At a similar age, and with determination, health, and Nick's own wonderful capacity to embrace new ways of living, he enjoyed and was enriched by an inspirational recovery that endured right to the end. He loved his time with NYU and reveled in his role as a teacher and mentor. The range of his work and the depths of his friendships with all of you good people are so evident to us now in these weeks of loss. Jerry and I saw lots of him in Ireland. Our Dublin house was a home from home for him. I learned to put my life on hold when we arrived. I allowed myself to be swept along with whatever interesting new project was on the go. His passion was utterly infectious. We have found ourselves becoming new vegans. He didn't seem to be the centre of attention, but he was. On the phone, on the computer, non-stop. And as Dermot said, he'd make you dizzy just looking at him. <laughs> From the mid-90s, with German first and with our cousin Deirdre and his friend Douglas, he planned and delivered his most extraordinary tours of Ireland, Scotland, Brittany, and most recently Galicia and Asturias, where we were privileged to join. A tour of Wales was already planned for 2023, and over many years he developed enduring friendships with tour participants. He would be utterly spent after the tours, but deeply satisfied. We enjoyed terrific family gatherings in his house in Canola and County Clare. He was very generous with his home and his local garden banks, and he made it available to many. Deciding to sell that house was an emotional wrench, but in the long run, Nick needed a cityscape setting with a vibrancy that matched his nature, and he found that in Bangkok. We visited him there twice, and we appreciated the lure the East held for him. He admired how the towns treat each other, their sense of fun, their tolerance of difference, their respect and care for the elderly. He relished the challenge and novelty of a different culture and of living where he was relatively unknown. Music was ultimately his entree to the world of the Mercy Centre, 
where he was afforded the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others. He was especially proud of instigating and funding the music program at the Mercy Centre. And with the children's growing pride in their own ethnic music, he made lifelong friends there. And they feel the same deep sense of loss at Nick's sudden death as we do. He was our anchor in the family, and we're floundering without him. I know many of you feel the same. I want to thank you all again for your extraordinary support, especially Dan, Doris, and Athena, for much help with today's funeral service. We know that your presence here is a mark of your love, appreciation, and admiration for Nick. You are all a great source of comfort to us. Late May and early June, just gone, is deeply precious to us now, because <clears throat> Nick was able to spend lots of time with us in Ireland in a gorgeous week of happy family and friend events. He relished every moment of his family time, celebrating the pre wedding of his niece, Emma, to James, and his dear friend, the musician Neil Sherman, at his wedding in Limerick. We're so privileged to have had Nick in our lives. And while today we say goodbye, Deirdre has reminded me that the Irish word for that has a softer meaning, slong for hold, goodbye for a while. That feels fitting in the sense that we already know that Nick's presence will always be close to us in the beautiful legacy of his work and his life lived to the full. So long before we get a spoke, I was going to leave the market. Thank you. Germantown, a place that on paper is among the last places on earth a musician from Limerick would 
cry. <laughs> but that's who he was. He had such a great respect for and an unquenchable thirst for learning the traditions, the history of people, just everything about the places he loved. The only thing he loved more than that was sharing all that information with others. It might not be an exaggeration to say that every, actually no, it's absolutely not an exaggeration to say that every single time we would walk out of the Bleecker Street apartment, I would get a New York history lesson crafted by whichever direction we walked. <laughs> In one of my signature moments of grumpiness one time, I very foolishly tried to tell him as he gave me the exact same step-for-step -step history of the East Village he'd given me so many times by then that he told me all that before and he rightfully ignored me and continued on. <laughs> there was a few additional times of getting this same exact tour later that I realized it wasn't about me at all. It was this genuine excitement about his love for the neighborhood and his way for sharing all of that information was one of the ways he expressed his love for the receiver of that information, mm -hmm. which can certainly be said about the music as well, obviously. Um, you know, any good father and son, especially two Irish ones, we had our ups and downs, which were always due to a lack of communication and a resulting lack of understanding. When the dust would clear, we'd always pick up where we left off as if nothing happened. My dad was great that way. More interested in resuming discussions of which Philly sports teams had the most potential to break our hearts than examine any kind of root causes to any issues we had. And both be surprised when it happened again, of course. But then it happened. About five and a half years ago, at a moment of very familiar revelation in my own life, it finally dawned on us. In many ways, we were basically the same person. <laughs> uh, any lingering and in hindsight very silly friction was immediately gone as the focus on differences shifted to an understanding and embracing of the similarities. I finally began to notice the true passion he had when talking about music, history, culture, stories involving many musicians in this room that I wouldn't dare repeat, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd see the delight and deep interest in his eyes as I tell him the most minute facts and full government names of rap artists that he'd never heard of, or stories of the misspent youth of my own that I always assumed I'd take to the grave with me. Uh, one of the last weekends I spent with him here in the city, he wanted to do something for my birthday. And on the suggestion of one of his dear friends who's here today, he booked two tickets for what was billed as a walking hip-hop tour of Harlem. And while rap music landmarks were certainly addressed, it was in reality a full cultural tour of Harlem in the 1900s. And it was perfect. Both of our cultural appetites were fully satiated, and to the surprise of no one here, I'm sure, he and the tour guide were instant friends. <laughs> Parting with an invitation that he had to come speak at his NYU class. So I have no idea if that happened, but I hope it did. Uh, I say all that to say that over the past five, past five plus years, we developed a true friendship to go along with the parental relationship. We got to know each other so much better as a result, so that while I, while I will miss him so much, my grief is tied only to his absence and not to any regrets. And that absence will be felt by all of us for a long time, but he'd be so uncomfortable with what I imagine he'd consider all the fuss of grief. Especially when he left the world so much to celebrate and enjoy for as long as he keeps making trips around the sun. And I'm not saying he shouldn't grieve. Grief is absolutely appropriate right now. But on his behalf, as I know he would feel this way, grieve only for him being lost to us in the physical form. Grieve the thought of him not seeing his name show up on your caller IDs anymore. Grieve the thought of him not being next to you on the stage or in the session or in your adjacent classrooms and so on. But if you can, I ask that you let the grief end there and allow for plenty of room for celebration. Celebrate your memories of him. Celebrate your moments of deep impact he had in your life. Celebrate all the art he gifted to us in all this time here. Call someone a mighty man today. End a conversation with a well-timed mind yourself. <laughs> Say your favorite sports team is the worst you've ever seen and that they're going to win it all, all in the same way. <laughs> Whatever you do, as this initial hurt lessons, just be sure to continue to honor him with celebration and joy in whatever way you see fit. Because it's how such a mighty man would want to be minded. Thank you. Very much. Oh. Hello. 
There we go. Can I just talk out loud? Yes. I have a grand big Dublin voice on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Lenny, there you are. The word you used that didn't leave me since you used it in, the, in those very early raw days that we were all spooling around in our own orbs somehow, you know, in our own different parts of the world, just get, come, trying to come to terms with something. And, um, this today feels like a long time in the, in the making, you know, before, and a word that Violet used a lot too in written messages to people was floundering. And there still is a little sense of that going on, you know, I mean, of course there is. But Finton says it all for me in, in another way as well about, about the celebrating a, a, a great guy's life, you know. And um, I grew up in Dublin, just, it's just little tiny postcards. I'm going to read the poem and just give me a little sense of pivotal difference he made and the radical difference he made in my life. I grew up in Dublin and always felt, felt this huge connection to my Limerick cousins. <coughs> so much of Violet's gorgeous depictions of Mick's early life in Limerick remind me of our family Lynchkin, our beloved Aunt Greta, Fuzzy Me. We just needed a lively name for her. She was incredible. She was single and free as a bird and travelled up and down Ireland in the school holidays. Well, they, back in the day when getting from Dublin to Limerick was a big deal, but we used to go to Clare for holidays for seven hours in the car, you know, so what you, and so we might not have been as close as we were, but the, um, the same gorgeous woman adored Nick, and she also taught me the Parsons interest in me and played the piano accordion herself, and she lit up our childhoods with stories of each other, um, and Mick had a big part in that too. She was refined and lovely, but, and, but, you know, encouraged the wildness in us. She really did, you know. Um, age gaps and distance meant that I didn't see Mick on a daily basis by any means, but he was this meteoric force across my childhood. A kaleidoscope. The antibodes told him one time I loved spelling tests. And, but Mick would not let me sit on my nine-year-old laurels about that. But for the next two years, he sent me postcards from all over Europe. With no nothing, no deep, no hello, no nothing, just big awful long words in them. You know, um, one worse than the next, bourgeois, um, and um, I swear to God, she tried to honor Matthew once. I mean, because I couldn't even find it in the dictionary. Um, but later, I'm sorry, I just need to take a little drop of water. Later on, um, as a young woman myself in my 30s, that same cousin Rick was literally my emotional support bridge out of a deeply traumatic situation to a far more beautiful way of life. Nick's own life of adventure has never stopped inspiring me since. I, I actually don't think I've had boring moments since about 1995. <laughs> just kind of loosely following his, his, his way of living and his stories and him. And his music. Um, he didn't do comfort zones though, at all, right? And he was a great fella for yanking you out of your comfort zone as well, you know? Um, but he kind of got to do it because he didn't do it. He, he walked the walk himself. He rang me up one grey Monday morning in Dublin. Will you mind my house in Penor for a year? I was all like, oh, make you very good. I'm great, you know? Thanks a million. That's a lovely notion. But like, I'm not really ready for that big move yet. I'm going to say, he said, they're all the back for lyric about wanting to live in chair. You don't make your mind up by Tuesday afternoon, I'm going to ask somebody else. <laughs> I was on the road by Friday. <laughs> and I'm trying not to worry about the fact that I'd asked him about another kind of comfort zone. Was there a bed in the place? And he'd hesitated slightly. <laughs> so, you know, it was, um, but, I, but I kind of never, you, you don't look back, you know? So between, yeah. It's just. <laughs> now, my co that's a, this is all a very long winded way to say to lead up to the poem I'm going to read out for you. Started off in another version of the same poem that he really liked. And he was delighted with the poem. It was about music, it was about his friendship with my brother that I've been obsessed with for years. And he one day, out of the blue, he was heading off, he was always hopping on a plane. And he was, it, this was always a last comment before he was gone and we couldn't call him back. And he said to me, by the way, there's a big mistake in the middle of that poem. He said, my poor Russell's mother never made me a cup of tea. You have her making me soda bread. And he said, she didn't, because he said she was wary of me. 
So he was gone. I said, what do you mean? Let's come back. That phone's going to the radio next week. Have a big trouble, Mick. And he goes, you figure it out. So I dug a little deeper. and then I, I learned much more interesting things, both about Michael and also about his mother, Annie Russell, who was indeed wary of Mick. Because that was back in the days when somebody come, she was she, she was a little fearful of where music might take her son. I think that was a good way of putting it. But the same woman had been a wonderful concertina player herself and a dancer. So, tech, you know, he, Mick, anyway, he, he, he liked the, the second version of it. So the poem was called, you know, Strings Attached for Mick Maloney. I am the tune that you shake free from Michael Russell's laurel tree. I am the tune that you shake, shake free from a West Clare cottage circa 1963. Dark roots needle the dueling sky and lace bright leaves in Michael's head. Spindle in tricky scenes of key, light and shadow across his mother's gorse patched home. You like the look of it, the mannerly fit of it, all air and grace and utterly unassuming. A house that knows the humours of whiskey and heather flower meal for the yellow goat of Lourdes. It's a cottage squash in its bedding, its back well crouched for the job, the entire Atlantic Ocean needing to be beaten back daily in time, in time, from its pounding just below Annie Maloney's bedroom window. I am the lord in a mother's house head fear foaming beneath her music's ear. The sea's cut, where the good air lifts the tail on your note of uncertainty. You tap the door three times, survey the woman's stone wall. Consider your options. Your lyric rake has an edge to it, yet an undercut as soft as my full skin. Nothing to be done, though, more is not rock face notwithstanding. Neither point, nor prize, nor fret. You let go, let go, let plectrums tremolo, float the crowbar, close your eyes. Finger your, finger your, sorry, close your, finger your trust in tones of, of mandolin coloured wood, as warm as a Dunabore's farmer's hand on a rambling pitchfork. You're young and you know it, this near death pulsing beat of life, but also the nuance in the swing, the slice of possibility and a great feel for why the widow is not the slightest bit impressed. Those back windows weren't made to be open to God knows what from wind off the sea. The glass is caulked and sawed, but wasn't Patty's keenest. Cut stone sound, beautifully smoked on the same. You walk to the devil and shake yourself, scatter the mud off your peacock's feather. That's it, the window's out, and a small bird sweeps the air. Now Michael may spread wings of blackberry blossom, pillowing the dream reel of his lover down in Louisville, cycle his bicycle straight from mass to shepherd's bush, bone, bone box button to link his old man's coat, his old coat with the boy's radiant. Radiant, back when he crossed Flanagan's wet field with Annie's blessing to learn the luminous warm, warm as Patrick's cap take the candle. No tea, no sulphurs, no whistles wet. Music in her mutterings though, Words skip skite across a dry kettle on a hob, water feeding small hostilities. Steamed ghost blooms a bellowed curl, a concertina to quiver, a hesitancy mist, and it's not lost on you either. You curve a note around an old echo of her grace. That coy pleat over one departing shoulder. You'd have settled for salt bread and scowls, even one salt herring, foreshadowing the smoked mackerel and avocado salad demanded by the music star pilgrims in Connor's home on Fisher Street, where in 1988 European tourists would storm the gate in search of Kevin Griffin's tenor banjo plucked to the core. But then, in the way of it, Kevin blues the air instead with his memory of Mrs. Russell's Bonaparte retreat. He's below in McGann's now, reading the Beth Harper tune. I am the gift of her ambivalence. She has enough list of foreigner notes left in the step of her leg to linger around your dance, you with the hair and the neck of it. The border free cadence, the rumours of a mini skirted girlfriend from Sweden and her first banjo. That was well and fine enough, but then my cripes, out appeared your reel to reel tape recorder, fishing notions out of her son's head and down the silver whistle of his voice. Liquid filters, limestone spills, 
music pours clean as a bell above the scabbard's water spring. Since Nick passed, uh, my mind has been flooded every day with stories and occasions that we we witnessed. And uh, as far as saying a few words about him today, all that stuff is locked away because it was uh, in the dead of night that some of the greatest experiences happened with with, with Nick at parties and late sessions and discussions I had with him. I always found a uh, little in New York um, and uh, where I am now, there's very, very little music, uh, traditional music available. And as far as the city is concerned, there's none either. And uh, uh, even though uh, Mick was in, in Bangkok, uh, many a time at 11 or 12 o'clock at night myself, I'd call him because I knew he'd be getting up around that time in Bangkok and we'd have a chat and we understood each other's um, so-called um, purist, uh, I'll, I'll use the word purist, uh, I'm not a purist but I'm, I might be a first cousin of being purist, <laughs> <laughs> about the music and the, the depth of it all and uh, how far the ones we were, the people we remember playing it, the heroes, the heroes of the music back in the, back in the day. So uh, 1962 comes around, and um, I jumped into the, uh, the revival, the folk revival, and the ballad revival. And I'm playing at different locations around Dublin. I'm only a kid, I'm only 14, 15 at the time. And uh, one of the people I met was uh, Mick. And he came with the Emmett folk group. And uh, there was a, a chap called Bulger with them also in that group, I remember. But Mick and myself uh, would meet occasionally this was after uh, two, maybe 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning at the folk clubs because they only got going after the midnight concert and Liberty Hall was over and uh, everything was a late start and then we had already put a night in in, in the bars and uh, uh, playing at different locations in the embankment and the old shielding and places like that. And uh, I was at the time also playing with the G with the um, the Johnsons as a guest of theirs on, uh, on every Monday night at the embankment. And also in that group was uh, Paul Brady. So we had we had the Johnsons, Paul Brady, be asked to do a solo and step up and go over, and then I'd be a go over. Okay. And uh, I made friends with Paul in, in the embankment one night, and uh, he introduced me to uh, his apartment on 62 Parmas Town Road, <laughs> which the other character in, in the room was Mick. And Mick was the other. Uh, 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 lodger in, in that particular apartment and we I lived about 10 minutes from there but my mother never knew I never told my mother about it and she used to say what sort of a dirty young are you coming from at this hour of the morning when I'd ramble in at 6 o'clock in the morning and find her going out to first mass and I'd never, I'd, I'd never off by, by, by offering her a lift down in time and to save you, save you being late for mass I'll, I'll drive you down in I come home and go to bed. But there, so it was 1962, uh, sorry, 1964, that Nick and I, and, Nick and uh, Paul Brady, started uh, with these unbelievable parties in that establishment, in the basement apartment. And uh, Mick went on after that uh, to, to join the, the, the Johnsons and later to be followed by Paul. and. Uh, we, he also started a folk club, one of those folk clubs, it was called the 95, 
was on Harcourt Street, and it was very famous, and uh, they really took off. And uh, uh, believe it or not, it was only a couple of years ago I realized that it had something to do with starting. Uh, we joked about the fact that we both remembered uh, a terrible incident that happened in that same club that he got at that time, and uh, previously, uh, months before, uh, there had been a terrible murder of uh, this lady that was going to use uh, UCD. And uh, she was killed by a chap called Mahangi. And we'll never, Shan Mahangi, we'll never forget it. And in that same basement where there was a, a pot, a stove, and uh, in the basement that we all sat on the stage and played opposite, there was a photograph in the Sunday press one morning of my uncle who was a, who was a fire department chief with, a, with a tongs and he going through the remains of what was in the stove. And, and that's where the, the, the remains were disposed of. And later, to have the folk club start there, and good old Mick was in, in charge, and uh, anyway, the walls were black, and the ceiling was black, and there was a couple of lights here and there, and kind of, but some of the, the, Emmet, the Emmet folk group were around in those days. And, some of the, the lolly was just after joining them, the Emma Spice and the, the folk thing was to really taken part, uh, taken shape. And uh, Mick, as I say, and uh, but he had uh, Tom Paxton in that part one night in his session. And with just these walking, walking giants of the music. And I took off for America in 67. God knows why, I don't know, I was having a great time in Dublin. <laughs> and, um, I had this, this idea of painting New York a few different colors, and uh, I only got around to the second coat of paint, and I gave up on that. And uh, yeah. uh, three years, uh, uh, I believe it was three years later, I landed on these shores, and uh, things all together changed, and the start of the music from the East Coast of America, which I was responsible for and then to Chicago for all the great musicians in Chicago. And he produced all these early records. And look, I've, I can't say, uh, after, after everything, after all my, my, my thoughts about what I might say nice about Mick, uh, it'd be like trying to squeeze uh, uh, War and Peace into it and, and write it on a post-it stamp. You couldn't. Just it's out of my bounds, and plus uh, I know that he would appreciate that this air I'm going to play. It's an ancient, an ancient air. Many hundreds of years later, it was there were words put to it by uh, on Raftery and Phila, um, um, Galway. Uh, uh, well, he was originally from Sligo, but uh, he he put words to it about Anna Coon. The, the terrible tragedy that happened in, in Mount Carl years years ago. But the air uh, goes back much further than, than the, the words of the song. And uh, actually, I, I considered Mick in a, in, a, in a much more deep version, to be a deep, much more deep version of, of Raptor. Because he did the same stuff, except that Mick, Mick uh, covered the world. He literally covered the world. And you see those obituaries covered in people were writing in. And uh, we should all shall be so proud that we ever had a tune with him or sat down with him or <coughs> talked a bit of music with him. So for Mick, I hope you like this one.
and it got a, a little bit of traction in New York's Irish community. <laughs> uh, at those grueling marathon drinking sessions, uh, sessions, Mick had a joke. It's not easy making hits. And you know what? It is not. <laughs> the group petered out around 2013, 2014 for a few reasons, some mundane, some less so, but Mick was right when he wrote in the album's liner notes that, quote, the WSHSO is the perfect New York City community band, a more colorful array of characters and a more likable, jovial, and good humor bunch you could not find when we get together. There are always miles of smiles. The Washington Square Harvard Sham Orchestra was a great, <coughs> Sham Rock Orchestra was a great group and turned out to be an incredible experience. The Ham Hop is a great example of a mixed special talent for making things happen. This talent manifested in all sorts of ways. <clears throat> it could be big things like supporting National Heritage Fellowship applications, or small but consequential things like writing the kind of undergrad recommendation letters that made a life-changing difference for somebody. He handed out opportunity like it was going out of style, and he took special pride in cultivating young talent. Uh, Liz, I remember when you came, uh, first started coming to the Ham Hop rehearsals, you sent an evaluation to Yaman, and I ran him to, <laughs> into him in the department the next day, and he would not shut up. <laughs> you just gushed. Uh, Mick recognized the interest and made folks feel special. Uh, he could find a yes in a shower of no's and see potential in unlikely circumstances. To me, Mick was Mike Flanagan and Barney McKenna rolled into one. He made sure I knew the difference between Dion Boussacol and Harrigan. He introduced me to Harry Bradshaw in the world of 78 Records. He hit me to the world of Con Carvin and lamented that I never met Frank Hart. He got me the gig at Elkins, made sure I knew who people like Joe Wilson, Ralph Rinsler, and Ken Goldstein were. He's the reason I've met an incredible assortment of people, many of whom are sitting in this room right now. He covered a lot of ground for me and I appreciated every bit of it. I think everyone here knows Mick was once to leave voicemails, and shortly before, uh, after he died, I checked my phone to see if there were any there. And I just, you know, I found three, including uh, <clears throat> one from 2016. That was a funny one to not have deleted. Uh, it began, Danielle, Mick here. <laughs> and he always, every time I picked up the phone, that's how he started. <laughs> Danielle, Mick here, I'm back home. My various chores completed. Jesus, things take a long time to do. <laughs> it's like he knew. And you know what? I'd love to believe that his chores were really completed, but we all know they weren't. Uh, he did have the other thing right, though. Things do take a long time to do, and he spent his time here well, doing just about all the things. Thank you. Georgia <laughs> asked if, um, if I would say a few words about um, my time with Mick in Philadelphia. I was, of course, honored, um, but I also realized that I couldn't talk about that without also talking about Eugene O'Donnell, because um, mm. Eugene and Mick were sort of the Batman and Robin of <laughs> Philadelphia Irish scene, um, and also for very sort of very practical reasons as well. I could not ignore Eugene, uh, Eugene in this particular uh, instance because Eugene was responsible for me being here on this planet at all. He introduced my parents <laughs> to one another <laughs> all those years ago um, in Philadelphia at the Irish Center. And, um, and it was actually, I guess, maybe 2018, 2019, when we had the memorial service for, for, um, for Eugene uh, at St. Malachy's in Philadelphia. Um, I told that story, I was one of the very few times I ever said anything to Mick that he did not know before <laughs> 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 he said it. <laughs> so, um, um, so, so Eugene had introduced my, my parents to one another, and then we moved back to, to Ireland. And over those years, you know, as kids we started to learn music, and my mother stayed in touch with Eugene, and then he started sending reams and reams of music over to us um, to learn. He handwritten, he would just jot down all these tunes, and there must have been a stack of music this big that he had sent over over the years. Um, so eventually we moved back to, to uh, Philadelphia, and um, it was like the early 80s, I guess, and I was about 12 or 13, and my parents took us all down to the Irish Centre, um, and Eugene was there. And fittingly, Eugene 
introduced me to Mick. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting in the room um, and meeting Mick for the first time. And it, for me, it was sort of like meeting a rock star, because I'd only, the reason <laughs> I played the banjo was because I heard Mick on the radio. And my parents had bought all his albums. And, and you know, so that's why I play, play the banjo. It was like, mm -hmm. and suddenly there's Mick um, just uh, there in front of me. Um, and Eugene sort of made the introduction and then was away. Um, and then over the years, sort of Mick, you know, invited myself and you know, my, oh, the whole family um, to spend time at the house in Harvey Street. And that became, the Harvey Street really became my sort of musical uh, education from that point forward. Um, you know, I, after high school, during high school, I, I pretty much, Fintan knows this, I pretty much moved in to Harvey Street. <laughs> and and Fintan, I, I know I was your babysitter for a while. I know, I don't know what your mom and dad were thinking. But the amount of times that I was just left there in Harvey Street with Fintan, um, it was shocking. Um, <laughs> But we had Betsy, the greatest German Shepherd ever. Um, so it was we were all we were all good. Um, but yeah, so Harvey Street was just this place where all of a sudden I was spending, you know, when I, if I wasn't in school or, or grounded, I was in Harvey Street, and um, and that's where I met. Looking around, so many people in this room I met for the first time in Harvey Street. Um, you know, Liz, Carol, Jimmy Keane, Jane, Johnny. So all these people, Billy McComiskey, um, all heroes of mine. And suddenly, you know, being 14, 15 years old, um, you know, just being in the room and, and suddenly playing tunes with all these people that I'd only, you know, heard on albums or on the radio. Um, so it was a sort of a magical, um, uh, education and just you know looking back and how special that was and mix um, generosity and um, basically he just like took me under his wing and brought me along um, showed me you know the mundane things like how to do a triplet properly <laughs> um, <like that. laughs> um, <laughs> down up down down That's um, but um, but also uh, traveled all over the place and playing. I, so my fondest, one of my fondest memories ever. And I always, when I'm feeling sort of, I don't know, uh, kind of fed up with it all, I often think about um, playing uh, this one particular concert that Mick and Eugene would do fairly regularly um, at Pastorius Park. Um, and it was this lovely kind of community event um, in this beautiful park out in Chester, is it Chester Hill? Yeah. yeah. Um, and this tiny little stage with the summer lights around it. And um, it was just sort of, I think it may have been one of the first places that Mick invited me to play out with him and, and Eugene. Um, and, but it was always this sort of lovely sort of environment. People just sitting around out on the lawn and picnics and, and it's really laid back and it was just such a, a lovely um, experience and I'll, it's always one of my favourite memories and Mick singing Brendan's Fair Isle or you know um, or, or John of Dreams, particularly John of Dreams in that environment um, I remember one summer look, looking over and it was like, it was always in like July or August so it was hot, it was, you could, unbelievably hot and looking over, and there was this pond, tiny pond in front of the stage, and it was just rotten with mosquitoes. <laughs> and looking over one, one time, and Eugene, who, you know, shocking white hair, uh, just blackened with okay. mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> he was playing away undeterred, but it was quite an image. Um, but, you know, so, yeah, I. Being here, I'm here because of Eugene. I play music now because of Mick, um, and so um, it's 
it's a, it's been sort of a sort of a surreal experience uh, since since Mick left us, um, and I often I've been finding myself th having a thought and going, oh, I must ask Mick about that, yeah. Yeah. and uh -huh. I'm sure, yeah, and um, and it's I didn't realize how often I did that. It just it was just the way I was like, have a thought. So I'll check that out with Mick and see what he thinks, and so you know, so kind of getting used to that. But then I realized, you know, that it's still sort of a barometer. It's sort of like you can have the thought and go, okay. Run it by. I still run it by me, <laughs> <laughs> and see um, if it's something that should be pursued or not. Um, but anyway, um, I I was thinking about what to play, and I couldn't think of anything. And, and then I realised this morning I woke up with this tune in my head, and and it's not a tune I've thought of for for ever. It's a, it's a fairly regular tune. But then I realised it's one of the first tunes, if not the first tune, that Mick taught me in mm. when. Uh, um, I went to Harry Street, um, and uh, Dan, thank you for the banjo. It's a tune I've not played in a long time, but it's, you, you all know the tune, uh, the Maid of Mount Kisco. Um, but I think it was one of the first tunes because it was, it's just, it's rotten with triplets. <laughs> so I don't learn how to do them. I'm probably going to miss them all now. So I'm going to play this nice as well. I'm not playing this in forever. And I have the excuse, this isn't my banjo. <laughs> Irish imports. He 
innumerable about men. A man from Dublin who wrote and published his own songbook and specialized in selling song sheets during the 20s and 30s. The type of vintage either song sheets that were sacred scrolls to men. While he loved living here in the village and he focused on learning everything he could about it, especially with one of his favorite books uh, called Simply the Village. Still, he wanted to know everything about everywhere outside of it as well, whether it was the Upper East Side or the Lower East Side and beyond. While he never lost his affection for Philadelphia, he became a real New Yorker. When Mick received a proclamation from the New York City Council at a ceremony in City Hall in 2010, it was an especially meaningful honor, one amongst many other highly prestigious awards. It was, I believe, Mick's respect for the power of place, the story to be found digging deep into it, and the importance of lifting it up that shaped his brilliance as a guy leading cultural odysseys in Ireland, about 200 tours in all. With Mick, travel was magical. Music rising up from the crossroads, ancient stones whispering the marginalia poetry of monks. Stories told by Nick were gifts, given through his druidic powers of memory. He was a genius for designing itineraries that would go beyond ordinary expectations, just as he would, in so many other ways, never be content to stop when he could go forward. And so I think of that day and our crossing Third Avenue on our way to the subway. The traffic light was blinking red, the warning that there wasn't much time left. Never one to be intimidated, Mick started to walk in his usual mile minute way, but I decided to turn around and stay back. When he got to the other side and looked over at me, still on the curb, well, I couldn't see his face clearly, but I was certain he was rolling his eyes. <laughs> I was no stranger to his eyes that might come along with challenging me to do something more than I was. And because it was so encouraging, I usually did. And that was what he saw to do for anyone he thought needed it. He made me brave. While I waited for the light to turn green, I watched him glancing over colorful stand of fruit illuminated by the string of lights. When I finally got across, he was waiting on the corner with a little brown bag in his hand, which he stretched out to me and said, here, you like blueberries. That was meant, the way he lived his life. He made every second of it count, never missing the chance to use time to find something special and then to pass it selflessly along. I cherish the memory of that day and all the days I knew Nick in this world. A friend who was kind and true. I will miss him for the rest of my life. many times when we'd be on tour, and I don't know why it was, whether it was the Greenfields in Milwaukee, or even the Jimmy and Robbie gigs, uh, it always seemed I had a really sad song that was played right before I was supposed to play a solo. <laughs> and, uh, so it'd be like, Kill Kelly. <laughs> I'd be like, now I'm supposed to play reels. <laughs> and uh, and I'd, I'd have my head back <laughs> as my nose was dripping. And, um, so I've just been thinking a couple of things since listening to everybody here, and it really occurs to me that one thing that I didn't think of saying today was that I do really feel like, in so many ways, Mick saved me. <laughs> and it's kind of endless. When he first got in touch in 1976 and said, come on and play at the mall in Washington, I was waiting for something to happen. And, and then he was that call. And then it was like, will you come on the tours with the Greenfields? And then I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and he, uh, he even called one night in 1980 
and uh, he called out of the blue, and he was uh, in, uh, it turned out he was in Winnipeg, and he was supposed to be playing with Eugene, and something had happened to June, Eugene's flight, or he wasn't able to go. And uh, Mick started that conversation by just saying, Liz, you should see where I am. Where are you, Mac? I'm in Winnipeg. He says, it's absolutely gorgeous. The stars are out. <laughs> it's just beautiful. And I said, oh my god, that's fantastic. He said, you want to come? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think ultimately, I thought that you couldn't uh, play music for a career. And uh, I had gone to school to be a school teacher. And I was having the most horrible first year teaching a seventh grade homeroom and an eighth grade. Why did they let me teach those years? Uh, but I was coming to the end of that year, and it was May, and I could see the end coming, and I was like, I can't do this again. I don't know how I'm going to do this again. Uh, will it be better the next year? And then Mick called, and he said, Liz, <laughs> Liz, there's a tour of Africa. When is it, Mick? <laughs> it's in September <laughs> for six weeks. And I just went to the office, and they said, yeah, OK, I'm done. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, when I had a chance to think, um, you know, I don't know how people write things so quickly on Facebook. I couldn't think. It took me a good two weeks before I could write anything. And what I wrote at that time was that Mick Maloney passed away a couple of weeks ago. And the idea that he's no longer in the world, singing and playing with the Greenfields, or teaching about the history and beauty of Irish music, or encouraging me and my fellow musicians to strive and get out there and make our mark is still hard to believe. It was always a joy to meet Mick. He more often than not greeted me with Elizabeth. He was always delighted to talk about old times going back to the 70s. Greenfields tours, 1976 in DC, Milwaukee, Irish Fest, Eugene, Hamper McBee, <laughs> the West Africa tour, Wagadougou, <laughs> Cherish the Ladies, Fathers and Daughters, Philadelphia and his love of so many places and people. And I also wrote, you can't call me now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's very small now all of a sudden. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'll miss the reminiscing and the moments on stage and not the rehearsals and the great fellowship of Irish and Irish Americans that permeated everything he touched. And I thank you for everything. Godspeed, Mick. And you were our leader, and we were happy followers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that I would do one thing, and uh, uh, if that's OK. Um, first of all, I did want to say that that first uh, Greenfields group, I did want to say everybody's name. Bill Ox was on the pipes, Jack and Charlie Cohen, Michael Flatley, Sean McGlenn, Mick, and myself. And that was our little group. And um, yeah. And um, so, what I wanted to play uh, just quickly was that Mick was in the car with me one time, and he said, That's a good tune you've made up. And he says, And you have to call it Wissahick and Drive. <laughs> and uh, I was like, Really? <laughs> and he said, they're going to change the name of Wissahick and Drive. They're changing it to Lincoln Drive. And he says, you've got to call it Wissahick and Drive. And this was another nice thing that Mick always did, because he, he would call you and just tell you nice things. And he called me one time, and we had played this, this tune on the Cherish the Ladies album together. And um, he called me from Ireland, and he said, Liz, Said I was just at a session and they're playing that whole set of tunes. Said I was a young kid next to me. He played every one of them, note for note. And, um, and I said, Oh my goodness! And he said, And I see said, So I said to the young boy that was leading it, and I said to him, You must like Liz Carroll. And he said, Who is she? <laughs> <laughs> and that's why he called. 
because that's funny. <laughs> so I thought I'd play Whistle Hick and Drive. Why not? <laughs> So of course, she 
Joni came in, she did a brilliant job teaching penny whistle, and about uh, two or three weeks later, Nick comes so shaking his head, and he said, oh, Mike, uh, you didn't pay Joni. <laughs> <laughs>
Holy, holy Trinity, as we called it. And then um, he was on the first Air Lingus flight, which, you know, when I met up with Nick, I told him that, and we made the connection with your, your dad. Chatting, the first chance on the Miami flight. So Nick came, uh, and Eugene used to buy tickets for my dad all the time in the 70s. So I was in grad, uh, college and graduate school, so yeah, I knew about it. And I used to see Nick, what like Shane said, at the Stories Park with Eugene all, off and on. I thought oh, this guy's pretty interesting. <laughs> so then I was in graduate school, and then I you know, decided to go full time with my dad in the travel business. And I came up upon this idea of doing tours, these cultural tours. But my uh, background is environmental education, but I wanted to tie in ecology, birds, lay the land, geology. So I went up, so eventually I, you know, I sucked it up and said, Nick, he didn't even know me, I didn't know him out of the you know, position. I said, hey, I said, can we get together and talk? So he's looking at me. He said, okay. So we go to Army Street, we have lunch, and I tell him this idea, and he looks at me and he goes, no, this is, uh, this is E. He goes, let me think about it. But in the meantime, you know, Let's do some business together. So the next thing you know, I was the uh, travel agent for booking. And this was before, this is when I was God, where before computers, before laptops, I had the OAG, official airline card, and dial phone. I mean, I could get anybody anywhere. I knew the Atlantic, uh, all, all the airlines, routes, cheap fares, because that was a big thing for musicians. I mean, they needed cheap fares because they weren't getting paid a lot in the gigs. So the next thing you know, I got to know every, every, a lot of Irish musicians, Jimmy Liz, James, and then they had these wild parties in Irish Street. And so I was around, I babysat Benton. <laughs> 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 and I walked Benton. And then when, when Mick, Phil, and, and Phil was a great woman. <laughs> and <laughs> these guys took off to, yeah, when were you born? Yeah, there you go, you're two years old. I never changed your diaper though. <laughs> <laughs> but then Mick, you know, yeah, Mick and Phil went out to dinner. You know, there I was, Billy, can you come over? And then um, these guys went off to Ireland, and next thing you know, I'm watching Harvey Street for a week or two weeks. My office was a short walk away, but it was the bachelor pad too. I had all the drink there, you know, I could walk to work, it was great. So we did all these travels, and you know, everybody's backstage saying, who are you? I was like, I'm Billy Dirk. So what do you play? I say, I play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know the music, but I don't know chord, and I don't know anything about, about the technical stuff. But yeah, you know, I was there for everybody because I was a travel agent, and you know, I could help them out. So we did that for years, and then uh, Germantown got a little too much, so my wife Don and I, we got married, and actually Mick, Eugene, and Jerry O'Sullivan played at our wedding in the church. We came, Don went in on a jig, and we went out on a reel. And, <laughs> and then we moved to Maine. So then eventually then I re reopened the travel agency up in Maine. And then I get this call, 1991. Because the ability, he said, I'm ready to do these tours. And this is when <laughs> he got his PhD, he stopped drinking, and he goes, I'm ready. And that was it, because we ended up creating these tours together that really changed both of us. Uh, the lay of the land, with, with the culture, it was reconnected. Mick, Mick was seeing all these musicians he hadn't seen. He was visiting places where he had never been, and he hadn't been at least for a while. I mean, we were going, went out to Torrey Island, we went to Alaska Island, we were to Clare Island. Well, we had a great trip with Clare once, but we had Eugene on it, and I was earlier, and I gave up the trip too. About 20 years ago, but back then I met up with Eugene. And we have a pint. And next thing you know, we're going on a ferry ride to Clary. And like Eugene's like, no, no, I can't go. And Mick's shrinking his head. So Eugene doesn't want to go. I'm like, ah, oh, come on, Eugene. So I ended up talking to Eugene and going on the ferry. And Mick says, he's all yours. <laughs> next thing you know, going out to Clare Island from Newport, boats like this. And then Mick comes up to me. I'm on the top deck, just looking out, enjoying the scene, just loving life. And he goes, you gotta go see Eugene. So I go down there and Eugene's just shaking his head saying, bad idea, <laughs> bad idea. And the next thing you know, I had to spend like 100 euros to put Eugene, when we got to Claire in the hotel there, laid him in bed and gave him tea. And everybody else was, was checking it out. Nick said, you talked him into it, you deal with it. <laughs> and that was Nick. I mean, one quick thing, one of our tours, the first tour, it was the first morning, we had a group of 40, and we were at um, in Clare, and I was 
there the day before, so I was setting things up. It's very cool. And actually, they're on this great open in the hotel. It was a family affair. They got everybody. Deirdre and Deirdre Star. Right. So here we are. Because when Michael was telling a story about Nikki and Joni, so I thought of this one. So here we are. It makes it set up the first morning with Eddie Lanahan, the storyteller. He said, you know, we want him to, Eddie to tell us a story. So we get there. Well, I'm already there. So I meet everybody at the, uh, with the bus at, at Shannon. And we stop and we have Irish coffee. And Nick's giving me the eye, like, Jesus. I'm like, hey, everybody, you know, they're Yanks. They like the Irish coffee. They're breakfast. You know, as soon as they landed, it was a big thing. So here we go to Eddie, Eddie set up where we went to a school. He was also a school teacher. He was an incredible storyteller. Some odd stories. Eddie, if anybody knows Eddie, some you know, odd stories. So next thing you know, here we are at the school. We get escorted into the auditorium. Eddie comes out with a couple teachers and another superior, and they start talking about school and different stories and all that. And Mick's looking at me, he goes, like, like I want to talk, like he's you know, giving me the eye. I'm like, good. So we got to the front door, here we are at the front door with the, with the uh, you know, statue of, of an angel or something over the front door of the school, and he goes, tell me there's something wrong here. I'm like, no. He goes, you don't think anything's wrong here? I'm like, no, and he goes, well, what in God's name are we doing? And so I was like, this is great. I said, you told me to do it. I was like, next time you set it up and you'll figure it out. <laughs> but so we were butt we butted heads once in a while. We're both Scorpios. <laughs> and, and this lasted, you know, for years. And we were in business, you know, and, and especially when it came to money with Mick, you know, it's a different story. I mean, sure you can be pals and all that, but you know, profit loss is a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> Mick was a money guy. <laughs> So then, eventually, I, I had to close it. We had to reach out travel agency in Maine. So eventually, I closed. And then, you know, we, doing, we did a couple tours afterwards. But then, Nick continued to do it with, with, with these ladies right out front here. But we stayed in touch. And, you know, I told my mother died. And also, speaking of uh, family, you know, I knew your parents, too. There were many times where they came over to Philly. And, you know, it was great getting together. I got shackled one time, though. Uh, Mick, senior. Kieran, Kieran was over with Mick, and they're sitting at the table in Harvey Street playing cards. I'm like, oh, this is interesting, and, and Maura and Phil are in the kitchen, you know, so I'm like, oh, I'll have a couple drinks with them. And then Mick's like, hey, you want to play? I'm like, well, he goes, well, I don't know, though. Next thing you know, I had 20 bucks in my pocket, five minutes later, I was gone, because it was gone. It wasn't alone, it was sharks at the table. <laughs> it really worked. <laughs> it worked. So fast forward. In July, or no, no, actually March, Mick calls up and says, hey, I'm coming to Belfast. Because meanwhile, you know, we moved from Biddeford, Maine, where we live, to Belfast, up the coast. Maine. And he goes, I'm coming up with Jimmy for the uh, festival. So that was March. Next thing you know, here's July coming along. And I was like, all right, this is the weekend. We're going to see Mick and Jimmy. So then Mick calls. I was texting Jimmy on the ride up. Where are you staying? He goes, oh, I'm staying in the Northport. Lodge. I was like, that's not a lodge. I said, I don't know who put you there. So then I get a call from Mick about 5 o'clock. Billy? It was a desperate Mick. Because Mick always called sometimes. Actually, I used to talk to him five, ten times a day for years. Where he was always looking you know, help or checking in with the numbers of the tours and all that. So I get this desperate call from Mick and he goes, we got a problem here. And he goes, there's no AC. He said, you got AC? I was like, yeah, because it was like 95 degrees in Maine. And he goes, I need to stay because this place is a kip. It has no AC. <laughs> so the next thing you know, you know, we had a guest room. Mick staying with us. I mean, I hadn't seen him in, you know, since Eugene's uh, memorial, like two years prior to that. So here we are. We're having Thai food that night and just talking about so many different things. We reconnecting all over the place. Wake up the next morning, have coffee, and then next, you know, the weekend they find a better um, hotel at AC. So there was Sunday night. I said, Nick, I want to come over and say hi. Oh, Don and I. So we went over to the hotel, and here we are looking over at Belfast Bay with schooners in the background. And we just start talking about all the kinds of things in life uh, and friends and passing and, and people that were dying. And then he says, You know, he said, you, just, you just never know when it's going to happen. He said, I'm, all, I'm, I'm ready. He goes, 
You know, I'm I, uh, looking forward to my uh, six-figure retirement from NYU. <laughs> I got everything <laughs> set up, you know, for, for Fenton and for, you know, everybody, my will's taken care of, and I feel good about it. And then he talked about the, um, the accident in Bangkok that he had a couple years ago where he got hit by a truck. And then there's this fellow, and then this Kelly saw, what's the name of the song? Ke uh, Kelly. Kelly. No, not Kill Kelly. Uh, the cat Kelly. Yeah, the cat. Kelly. Damn, what's it called? The Kill Kelly. Right. Has anybody here seen Kelly? No, no, no. <laughs> the Kelly. <laughs> the Kellys. And this guy, Ke uh, uh, Nolan, wrote this song. Uh, Sean Nolan. Sean Nolan. And Mick told us his story about the spirit that lives with him from Nolan. Because the day he got hit, was the day, the anniversary day of this guy's Nolan's death. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting the flag from here. <laughs> but this is, I'm near the end there. And also near, near the mix end. So he started saying, you know, there's something out there. He says, maybe, you know, there is a power out there. I'm like, wow, this is like, wow, you know. So we said goodbye. Well, and then a couple of days later, uh, Jimmy calls me. Billy, Mick is dead. I said, what? Mick is dead. And it, it was pretty wild hearing that. It really was. It was everything flashed. Just like everybody in this room there. Maybe that's the one. Everything flashed before you. But really what was remarkable is that I just, I just seen it. It was just so intense. But it was beautiful, too. It was great getting together with him. It was a great forum. He was ready to try to come back for a visit. It, it was really cool, and Mick always had this positive about him, but you know, he went a mile a minute. I kept up with him lots of the time. And he was a true sports. I'm a sports guy. He was no Eagles. <laughs> he was a true sports guy. I showed him until he was Anyway, thanks for listening to my ramblings, and he really was a good guy to rock on this. Thank you. Thank you.